Welcome to the Piston Fanatic. I'm your host Dave Dalton and I'm excited to share my passion and perspective of our Detroit Pistons as we go on this fantastic voyage together. I've been a diehard Pistons fan since the days of Dave Bing and Bob Lanier. I've also been a varsity basketball coach of a very successful program in northern Michigan. Currently my daughter and I are coaching one of the best AAU teams in the country. Well Piston fans, I think I have an interesting topic today. We're going to break down uh, the different scenarios for each Piston player and the domino effect that they can have on the roster for this season and next season and going into the future. So there's a lot of things that are going to really take place this year. And we're just going to walk through it with each player. And we'll start out with Cade Cunningham because uh, I think everything starts and ends with Cade. But there's not as much of the domino effects what will happen with Cade because Cade's going to be Cade. Cade's going to have the ball. He's going to... Uh, take a lot of shots but anyway so Cade last season he he averaged about 33 minutes a game which is a good amount and he should average at least that this year he took 18 shots a game which is quite a few shots and so I still think he will project to take that many shots at least this year the thing that's going to change though is I'm very confident that his percentages on his twos and his threes is going to jump significantly. So he took five threes a game, and I think he's going to take that many. Again, I watched uh, the tape of uh, him on the select team playing against the FIBA U.S. team, and his arc looked better, and the Rico Hines run, his arc looked better. And, of course, it's just a few shots. We don't really get to see or really know, but I'm very, very confident that his arc will get better and his two-point percentage will go up and his three-point percentage will go up. And bigger yet, I think that he is going to get a lot more free throw attempts because he just didn't get that many uh, free throw attempts. He only took uh, got 3.6 attempts free throws per game last year. And so I think that is going to go up this year. So I think his, his, av his scoring average is going to go up. It's hard to project on a lot of guys, and I still think there is. We're going to talk later about uh, Bojan Bogdanovic because his impact on everybody's scoring. So anyway, uh, Cade, let's look at his salary. So he is this year, he is going to be making $11 million. following year, $14 million. The following year, um, he, he can get his rookie extension. So if he gets a rookie max extension, it's going to be for like LaMelo got like 260 million for five years so what it comes down to and most of these players are going to sign that is, is but is he going to be worth the rookie max i'm very confident i think most people are that he's going to get the rookie max and it's, it's a lot of money so what it is really is it's 25 percent of the total salary cap so that means he's going to make a quarter of you know what our team can pay pay their players so anyway uh, it varies each year, so it's not just based on, you know, when the salary cap goes up, then the amount the player gets paid goes up each year. So it's, you can't really exactly uh, figure out exactly what it is because it could increase based on what the salary cap is. So, um, but he's going to be eligible at the end of the season, and so if he gets injured, and, and knock on wood, that, that doesn't happen That'd be disastrous, but I don't think it will. I think he, you know, he's a young player. His injuries haven't been the kind that are, are um, that would occur again. You know, they're not. You know, just things that happen to players. So, anyway, I think that you know we're going to sign him to the rookie max, and he's going to be with us for another seven years at least. So that's exciting. So, um, next we're going to just quickly talk about Jaden Ivey. Uh, he took. Played 31 minutes. He's only 21. Cade's only 21. He's going to turn 21 two in September. Ivy's 21 only, and he's um, played 31 minutes a game. Took only 13 shots. His percentages weren't great. He shot 42% and and then 34% on threes. But those have shown signs. He was much better the second half of the year. His form looks good. He looked good in Rico Hines, which again is just small sample size. I don't know how much you can put into it, but. Things will happen to uh, his t game this year. And the, it, like I said, we're going to talk about how cause and effect. So I still think he could get 13 shots a game this year. But there's still, you know, if he's playing with Cade and Bogda Bogdanovich, he's not going to get as many shots. But even more so, he's not, you know, he averaged 5.2 assists. That really went up per, um, per assist per game the second half of the season when K, especially after K got hurt and he had the ball in his hands and 
but he's not going to have the ball in his hands near as much. So he could be just as good or better passer and get fewer assists. So he's, uh, for this upcoming year, is going to make $7.6 million. And so, you know, your rookie deal is for four years for these um, high first lottery picks. And it goes up and they're, they're locked into these amounts. So every rookie based on where you get drafted each year. So Ivy was the fifth pick. So that's why his is like lower than what Cade's was. So Cade, his first year, even though it was a year prior, made $10 million his rookie year. But anyway, Jaden's going to make 7.6, then followed by 8 million a year then 25 26 10 million and he's going to be uh, eligible for a rookie extension and what happens is so Cade like Cade is you know I talked about his he's going to be eligible so we can sign him to the rookie extension at the end of this year but the following year he's already locked into that amount which is 14 million so he and then we get him for four years after that for the rookie max, or five years, excuse me, five years after that, for whatever the rookie max is, 25% of what our um, salary cap number is. So, and Ivy will be eligible for the same thing. So here's a real tricky thing that it's going to talk about. So if, if K gets a rookie max, and Ivy gets a rookie max, and Dern gets a rookie max, and Asura gets a rookie max, that's 25%, that's, that's 100%. So they can't all get the rookie max. So that's what gets hard. And then when teams get even bigger salaries, when players after after their rookie extension, then they're eligible for even more money. Especially if you make if you make all NBA for second or third team, then you can get the max extension. And so it's going to be challenging for the Pistons. But we have a we have these guys under contract, and we should be able to keep them under contract at a decent price for quite a long time so that that is the cool thing about having these good young players so um like i said his touches might go down his assists will go down and but the thing that we need to count on this year is his defense going up so he's going to be a big part of the pistons we all know he's such a hard worker he's diligent he cares about his defense he's a freak athlete so he has the talent to do that i'm going to I can't say this enough times. I think that Dan Burke, our defensive coordinator and the new coaching staff is going to get the players to play better defense. I think that Ivy cares about it. And so I think that he's going to be a much better defender this year. But um, Jalen Duran is um, 19 years old. Still, he's um, played 25 minutes a game, only took six shots a game, he shot 65%. So he didn't shoot any threes, but he will be shooting some threes this year. We got to see it. Uh, again, at the um, on the select team when he played for the select team, and then also at Rico Hines, he just shot one, but he he made it. But you know, he made two shots on three, so he's uh, going to look to do that. I don't think a lot, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if he averaged maybe one three or, or just a little bit under one three a game. So um, he, the incredible thing about him is he averaged three point four. Uh, offensive rebounds, which is just an incredible stat, especially for a guy only playing 25 minutes. So that's, I, I expect his minutes to go up. I know it's really hard to project. I heard some guys on podcasts trying to project the Pistons players, their um, averages for scoring and percentages and rebounds and assists and stuff. But it's really hard because that's what we're discussing, the cause and effect that all these different players can have on each other. But I don't think that, I think his role is going to be locked in. It should be 30 minutes, but I'm not the coach, but I just think that that's what's going to happen. And so I think that he easily could average uh, 14 points and um, probably 12 rebounds, which is an amazing number for a 19-year-old. So I think he's going to show us more shooting from different places, more post moves, more mid-range jumpers. And I just think that he has got a lot that he is going to um, elevate our team. And, you know, the cause and effect for him would be Wiseman and Bagley. And so at the end of last year, he didn't play as many minutes as I thought he should. They didn't even start him. And I, I got to believe for sure that he will start this year. And um, But they were playing Wiseman ahead of him to try to get Wiseman acclimated and try to see what he can do. So, you know, if... If they want to play Bagley and Wiseman's minutes, you know, they could 
take away from his minutes. So those that's a little bit of cause and effect that that could have there. So anyway, we're going to jump over to the one I think has the most ramifications for potentially affecting more players than anybody is Bojan Bogdanovic. And he played 32 minutes a game last year. I think that he will average for sure less minutes if he is still on the team. He took 15 shots, six threes a game, and shot incredible percentages. He averaged 21.6 points a game. And his effective shooting was 57%, which is really high. But he is signed for this year for $20 million, We're going to pay him. And next year for $19 million. So this this the trade for Boyan was one of Troy's best moves. And it, it was a great trade that we got somebody this good um, for nothing, really, that we really cared to have. So it's we're just going to see what happens and... A lot of things can happen. There's so such a, a wide scope of things that could happen with him. And so we're going to go through those. So we could trade him before the season. Tra Troy traded for him just before last season. So he could trade him before this season. And also he could trade him, you know, partway through the season and or at the trade deadline. So those are all options. And I think that it's going to have such a huge impact on Asur Thompson more than anybody, because if he's playing 32 minutes or 30 minutes or 28 minutes, that will take away minutes from a sore. I mean, obviously they can play together, but there's still, it looks like, you know, if they want to play Stu at the power forward, that he will, that he'll, they'll have to get their minutes at um, the small forward position. A is so talented, and we'll talk about him in a minute, but he, he could play other positions too. So anyway, um, we can even trade him at the end of the season. So there's lots of different chances. He should be in demand. I'm not. I'm just puzzled why somebody hasn't given us an offer that we can't refuse for him, which, again, it, I think the speculation is that it's a first-round pick. And so I would take that. And I, you know, again, I'm just sharing my opinion. This is all just food for thought for you guys. You all can have your own opinion, but hopefully my podcast, you might not agree with me, but it makes you think about what you would want to do. And of course, it doesn't matter what any of us want to do. It's what Monty Williams thinks we should do and Troy Weaver. And there is some talk about, you know, how much my, uh, Troy had impact on the playing time um, that Dwayne Casey used. And, you know, so Killian's an example of that. I think that I don't know whether Dwayne or Troy said play him or and start him or if that was just because... Uh, Dwayne knew how much Troy wanted him to play, that he did it. Same thing with Weissman at the end of the year, why you know why he started ahead of Duran. And again, I think that's going to be different. That that was a certain a different situation, and Duran had some injury at the end of the year too with his ankles. But anyway, um, we'll see what – I'm not sure that Troy will have any impact on who um, – Monty plays. And of course, you can't be, you know, he's still Monty's boss and he still knows, is going to know his opinion. There's still going to be, a, every franchise should have good uh, communications between their um, general manager and their head coach. And they should have some give and take and, you know, try to agree on some different things that are, are best for the program going forward. So, Anyway, we'll see what happens with Bojan. That, again, that, that's a wild card. What could happen with him? And he impacts even Cade and Ivy, how many shots they take. If, if Bojan's taken, if Bojan's not with the team, those 15 shots get dispersed, you know, maybe more for Cade and Ivy and different people. So uh, the next player we're going to talk about is Stu. And I say this all the time if you've listened to my podcast. I love Stuart. He, he's only 22 years old, so he has... Lots of room to improve. He's a hard worker. He's going to improve. He busts his butt on the court, but I, I still am not sure he his how high his upside is. I would not be surprised if he starts this year, but this is a big year to find out. So my big thing though was not that he wasn't worth. I'm sure that contract's probably going to be a good contract that we signed him for. My my big thing was why did we have to sign it? I, 
before this year. We could have seen what he was going to do because it's still way up in the air how he's going to shoot the three. You know, I'm not even sure. You know, we all say I, I, I get a little bit perplexed that, you know, and frustrated sometimes that people like to slap on labels. Stu's a great defender. So we all, everybody, everybody that does podcasts for the Pistons and writes automatically says Stu's a great defender. Well, he's good, especially when you consider his limitations. He's undersized for a five, especially. He can't jump and he's not fast. And so those are things that make you a good defender. He is He's smart and he works extremely hard and he can switch out on guys and move his feet. For a five, he's really good. But now he's going to be playing the four and he's going to be every night playing bigger, quicker guys. And we're not bigger, but quicker guys. And so it's going to be interesting to see how good his defense is. But I still think it's not right to say we automatically say Wiseman and Begley are bad so it's just all it's like black and white Wiseman and Begley are bad Stewart's good on defense and and it's true Stewart's a better defender than Wiseman and and Begley and Begley and Wiseman both if they want to be if they want to be part of a real good team they have to up step up their game defensively but it just it just intrigues me that people just still slap labels and then people everybody just regurgitates what they hear from everybody else and it's not it's not so black and white in my opinion is what I'm saying so uh, Stewart took seven, only seven shots a game he took four threes this past year which was way up from what he did before he only shot 32 percent on threes and he averaged 11 points a game so he's getting paid a lot of money for a guy so just recently. There, they had. Um, There's a player, PJ Washington, that just signed with the um, Charlotte Hornets, and so PJ uh, couldn't get a contract. He ended up signing a contract relatively the same as Stu. The only difference is PJ's 25 and Stu's only 22, so Stu's got more upside probably. Stu's not as good an athlete, and PJ averaged over 15 points a game and shot threes at like 36% for his career. So. Again, and that's, you know, to, to compare the two players, and everybody tries to, but that's, you know, P.J., I still wouldn't mind have, having him for a backup four on our team if we could trade him for, you know, not too much. But, um, you know, he starts, he's going to start, but, you know, everybody knows Troy loves him, and Troy gave him the contract, and there was, people just said it like it was a, uh, you know, not even a matter of opinion. It was a matter of fact that, that oh, yeah, we had to sign give him the extension otherwise Troy wouldn't have had anything hit on his cl- draft class in 20 um 2020 so that's why we have are we're paying him that much money and again I, I'm not saying that's a bad contract I'm just saying we could have waited until the end of this year he would have been in restricted free agency and I'm going to tell you if he would have even if he plays good this year which I hope he does and think he will he is still not going to get really any more than what this contract was so that's why my point is that why we we had to or didn't have to give it to him. My still opinion is going into the future is, um, you know, we're paying him $15 million a year, but my opinion is that he will be potentially a great backup player to come off the bench, sixth or seventh man on a playoff team that's real successful, and he'll bring lots of energy and lots of um, – toughness and he does bring a lot to the team the intangibles off the court and just his presence it's contagious how hard he works he cares and again he it's going to be interesting and then even if he does end up playing some center and what's going to happen if he doesn't hit the three good what's going to happen if he you know the last it's ironic the last two years his he shot 11 percent on threes during the month of january so we just got to hope that Stu gets through the month of January this year but in a little bit better shape. So, uh, The next we're going to talk about the guy with the most um, wide range of outcomes, I think, is James Weissman. He's only 22 years old. And, again, people try to uh, – he, he is not liked. I, I would just certainly say that people don't like him. And, I and again, I – he tries hard. I understand. Usually, that is the thing that people love about a player. He he busts his butt. I mean, you, you watch the game. If you watch, you, he does. But again, I think sometimes there's a narrative out there, and the narrative narrative just gets repeated by everybody. And he was a disappointment. So here's the thing. I I you know Mitchell Robinson and Nick Claxton and Zubek and 
Jakob Pertl, and um, there's a lot of these centers that are starting centers and good players in the NBA that weren't good at the beginning of their career, but they weren't drafted number two in the draft. So I think that's really haunted Bagley and Weissman and affected their psyche and affected people's opinions because they're labeled disappointments. And so he certainly has been, but he's been hurt. He, he played three games as a freshman in college, and then he got hurt, and then he got on a team that was world champs, and he didn't get to play, and it, it, you know, it just a whole bunch of dominoes fell. So my thing is, I don't disagree with all of you that say he needs to play better defense, because he does, and he also posts up too much. He does. But again, again, I think that we're paying Monty a lot of money, and I hope that the coaching staff can um, get him to play better at defense. Dan Burke, I think, can. I think that, you know, if coaches say, well, James, you're gonna if you post up all the time, we're not going to let you play. But I'm sure they're going to – Monty's going to integrate his offense. He's going to put him in position. And James, if James doesn't play there, he's not going to get to play. And so I, I just think that, that a lot of things are on the coach, a lot of things that people get mad about him. They, you know, And the other thing he is, he has been – like a black hole, I think it, it seems like to me every time he touches the ball, he has to prove to the world that he's a great player and he tries to just score every single time. I will say this, I I, I think I said it on a prior podcast, but through he's played 84 games in his career and through 84 games, he his first 84 games, he's had more dunks than anybody in the NBA history. So, and, and Duran's not far behind him. So I think we're going to have a dunkathon this year during the season. So I think it's going to be cool, but he's making 12 million this year at the end of the year, he's going to be a restricted free agent. So that means that we, anybody that offers him, can, we can match it. So, you know, again, I, that's why I want us to, you know, we could have done that with Stewart too, but he's going to have a, to prove that he's worth an extension. It's going to get tricky. So if he plays bad, obviously we will quit playing him after, the first month or month and a half of the season, he probably will lose his minutes to Bagley and Stewart. So that that's a possibility for him. He could play pretty good and play like a good backup center. And then we're going to have to face, you know, do we think he's getting better? You know, and we're going to, have we got to see the improvement? How well is he being affected by the coaches? And then we got to decide, um, do we want to offer him an extension and will he accept it if he thinks he's better than that or if we let him go into restricted free agency and don't extend him um, then we have to match what another team gives and so is another team going to um, pay him a bunch of money extra for the upside the the trend seems to be that teams are not trying to match um players that are, are restricted free agents. That's just not happened. Even with P.J. Washington, it seems like he should have got, you know, seems like he should have got an offer from somebody, but I think that um, they're, they're just not matching. This has been the trend that people don't try to match people because they know the, the other team can match, but there's been players who have ended up getting, um, I think, in my opinion, underpaid, and nobody gave them an offer, but all right, so we're going to see what happens. And there's another possibility. We could trade him. If somebody wants him, you know, we could certainly trade him. So or we, at the end of the year, we could even do a sign-in trade with him. But the, the bottom line is he's over seven foot tall. He's athletic. He's got skills. And those things are rare to be that athletic. I mean, he's got more talent than probably Mitchell Robinson, Nick Claxton, Zubek, and Portal. And so... You know, we'll see what happens, but that's going to be very intriguing to watch this year. What can happen? And obviously, if he plays well, that could mean that Bagley doesn't get to play minutes. Uh, you know, and or maybe Bagley's going to get to play some at the four. Are they going to try to play Duran and Duran and Weissman together? You know. We saw that way too little. Everybody says it didn't work. It was terrible last year. It didn't look that great last year, but it was just a teeny, tiny, small sample size, especially with Weissman and Duran. It was hardly any minutes, and it, it might not work. But my my thought, though, is this year is that we 
probably don't start games that way, but that at some point for like 10 or 15 minutes a game, that maybe depending on what the other team has, that we let them play together. So that it's just going to be intriguing to see. So uh, next player we're going to talk about is Asur Thompson. And again, we the, the Pistons over the last few years have um, started their first round draft picks. And is Asur going to be the first one that doesn't get to start? I mean, we started Killian and we even started uh, Sadiq and Stu and we started Cade, obviously, and Ivy and Duran. Well, Duran didn't get, to, didn't get to start at the beginning of the season, but our our high picks were all got to start. So there's definitely a question whether he's going to. And I I would love to I would love to be able to have a pass to go to a training camp this year to see these battles between Weissman and Bagley and Stewart and and to see how a sore plays. And again, all we really got to see is the footage of Overtime Elite on a sewer. And we got to see the little, the Summer League four games. We got to see the little Rico Hines run. And, you know, it does show a lot of promise. But rookies tend not to be good on defense. But I think that a sewer is going to um, break that trend. I think he's going to, he's special. I think his athleticism is unbelievable followed by his work ethic and his desire to be great on defense, his anticipation that he showed even in the summer league. I mean, the, you know, he blocks these guys' shots. He, he, these guys are shooting, six, eight guys are shooting jumpers, you know, uh, with him on guarding him. And he just gets up and blocks their shot. He just anticipates and his timing's great. Seven foot wingspan. And the other thing is besides, you know, he's a freak athlete and he, he's very unselfish and he's going to move the ball. And he's a great passer for that. Again, it's gonna. Again, I'm sure he's gonna have some turnovers as a rookie, which is normal. It will be interesting to see how many threes he shoots a game. It's gonna. I think it's gonna be a small number, but we, you know, hopefully his shot is improving as we speak. And I think that he, uh, he's just gonna be a, a great player for us. And everybody can't score. Everybody can't take shots. I've been talking about how many shots each guy takes. You know. And you add them up, and there's only so many shots to go around. The The beauty of a Sewer Thompson is he can do so many things at elite level that aren't shooting, that he can impact the game on the court. So, But the big thing is going to be, again, like I said, if Boyan stays on the team, it might mean that he doesn't. And if we want to, maybe we would win a few more games this year if Boyan, we didn't trade him, but maybe a Sewer wouldn't develop as much. And so the a big thing, I think, again, I didn't mention this. I, I think the thing that would be cool to see is if we if we don't don't get a great trade for Boyan before the season is that we play it out and we see, you know, how the minutes go, how Asur's playing, how Boyan's playing, if the team's winning, if it doesn't look like we're going to have hang around and be in a mix for the play-in game, then that would impact a lot of how um, what we end up doing. So I know this podcast is going to be longer. I try to, I've been trying to keep my podcast a little bit shorter, but this is going to be a long one because it's got, got a lot of players to go through. So anyway, um, we can see, again, I, I'm never going to stop saying, no matter, even if he isn't playing great, I want to see him play 25 minutes a game. And I still think that the thing about him is he can play multiple positions. He can play the two, three, four, I think for sure. And he can guard anybody. And so that just makes him so valuable. So, Anyway, uh, Marvin Bagley pl played 23 minutes a game. He looked so great, good at times. He took nine shots. He shot 52%, and he only shot not that many threes. He only averaged about 1.6 threes a game. Rebounded 6.4 rebounds, 12 points a game. His minutes were always sporadic. He started one minute. He got hurt the next minute, and so he's never really got to play. I still think that Troy, you know, signed him because he thought he had great potential he gave him that extension which a lot of us thought maybe the last year should have been um team option but it, it, it's not so we have him for two more years he, um so we have him for this year for two and a half million the next the following year for two and a half million and then he'll be unrestricted free agent so we could trade him um but you know somebody has to want him 
and somebody has to want him for something, you know, of value. Otherwise, what is it going to hurt for us? I mean, I know it would be frustrating and maybe even a challenge for the locker room to have Marvin Bagley not getting to play or James Weissman not getting to play because they all they're both young. Bagley's 24, you know, he's been in the league forever and he's only 24 years old. So uh, I, we'll see what happens. But I, the, again, I, I still th contend that these big guys get hurt and that the chances of Stuart Weissman, Bagley, and um, Duran, that, that they could get hurt. And that then all of a sudden, we don't have too many. If, if just one of those guys gets hurt, then all of a sudden we aren't short on big guys. So anyway, talk about Monty Morris. He's 28 years old, right in his prime, 28 is about people's prime he averaged 22 minutes a game last year took nine shots and um, excuse me i'm sorry he, he averaged 27 minutes uh, and then with the nuggets the year before and the nuggets were a better team than the wizards he averaged 30 minutes a game and with the wizards he shot 8.3 shots per game and with the nuggets again a better team he averaged 10 shots a game but the big thing about him is he is just steady eddie with the ball his uh, assist to turnover ratio last year was he averaged 5.3 assists, one turnover. He's never averaged more than one turnover, not like 1.5 turnovers. He averaged one, two different years than below one the other years. So he is priceless to have, you know, especially when you have a young team. And the cool thing about him is, like, like I said, he's not, he's still in his prime. He is still an athlete, you know, and he's making 10 million a year. He'll be a free agent at the end. Could we extend him during the year? Again, we're going to get to see how does he fit? How does he play? And that, that's going to be another fascinating storyline of this season is to see, you know, if, if the team does well and he fits well and he's a, a real good backup point guard, then, you know, we resign him unless, again, somebody else could not blow him away with a better offer. So, um, Alec Burks, again, he is my man last year. He, uh, he's 32. He just turned 32. He's, uh, played 22 minutes only. He should, I thought he should have played more minutes than that this year. I'm not saying that he should, because we we're going to see there, you know, our team's better this year. And so maybe 22 minutes is a good amount. He took only nine shots, shot 44% from the field, 41% on threes, which is awesome. And he only took 4.7 uh, attempts on threes, he shot 81% on free throws, averaged 13 points, and he's priceless. I Again, could we trade him? Yes, we could trade him before the season. You know, I, I, I really wonder, you know, people leaked out, especially there's a lot of these people who love Stu, but, you know, people talk about trades all the time. Why does it leak out that Stewart had the Celtics and the Pelicans were interested in a trade? I can't believe that nobody's interested in Boyan and Burks, because they, they are true, proven NBA quality players in shooting, and shooting's at a premium. So, but we'll see. So he, that'll have a big impact whether we trade him or don't trade him. And the thing about him and is that, you know, and Monty, is there a free agent set in this year? So that's going to really impact how we look at Marcus Sasser, and even Killian Hayes, and I, again, everybody speculates, and I agree with them that Killian probably is not going to stay around, but I don't think anybody's going to want to trade for him. I don't think you could you could ever get a second-round draft pick for him, and we're not going to, you know, we're, we're better off just keeping him. Again, if there's injuries to the backcourt, he could fill in Killian. We're talk, we're, I'm jumping around now, and he he's still a very young player. He showed some signs of being talent, but I I. I'm not sold on Killian Hayes, and I'm just saying, though, if we have him and we can extend him, he'll be a restricted free agent, and if that, that's a decision. If he is good in the locker room and people think he's working hard and improving, and then all of a sudden, Burks and uh, Monty Morris, Marcus Morris, excuse me, Mark, Marcus Mor Monty Morris, and I'm getting all goofed up, Monty Morris, if they don't sign with, resign with the Pistons, then we're going to have vacancies at the guard position, except we also have Marcus Sasser. So that's, that's where that could come into play. So we're going to talk about him. Uh, he's, you know, he's, he's going to be 23. He's going to be 23 years old on uh, September 21st. Do you remember the 21st day of September? That's one of my favorite songs by Earth, Wind & Fire. But anyway, 
my sister's birthday is the same day. So Marcus, you share that with her, but she's a little older than 23. So uh, Marcus Sasser's, he, for what, you know, when you're drafted later, he was drafted 25th. So he gets only 22.6 million this year, 2.7 million next year. Then there's team options for guys drafted out of the lottery for, that are first round picks. And they, so his 2025-2026, um, he would be, get $2.8 million. And 2026-27, he'd get $5 million. But those last two years are team options. So it's going to be fascinating. I know that obviously Troy loves him and he's a tough, work, hard worker and that likes to defend, which is always valuable. He can shoot the three. He is undersized and we are loaded at the guard position. But like I said, everything can change depending on what happens with um, Burks and uh, Morris. So I see Livers. He's a real tough one. I loved him and I thought highly of him. And, you know, he got to play. He's 25 already, you know, and he's not really even got a chance to play. But he did play in over 50 games this year and he averaged 23 minutes. And that's, you know, that's kind of a chance. He's really been given a chance, but he was hurt so much in and out of the lineup. He, you know, he missed his first year pretty much the whole year. And then this, this last year, he missed a lot of time. But he um, didn't shoot as well. He shot 36%, which is good. But that's supposed to be his calling card. Is his value to the team is by making threes and playing real good defense. But I just right now, there's where are the minutes going to be from if he, you know, there's not minutes for him. So I they'll probably try to find some minutes for him. But it's going to be a challenge. And again, hopefully he stays healthy and that something happens. But again, that could he could play the three, some backup three if get some of those minutes if we traded Bojan so um, I just you know it's going to be interesting to see what happens he's still a great guy to have on the end of your bench and and he, you know, whether he plays a lot or not um, a big question mark for everybody I think is Joe Harris who makes he's 32 years old he's just turning 32 so but he's that's still not too old and he's he's making 20 million this year so he will be a free agent at the end of this year but he does have trade value. I don't see where the minutes are going to come for him with everybody else. But, I mean, the guy, the people from um, the Nets say that he still can play. And, you know, he got had a bad ankle injury. So he had um, he went down to 20 minutes a game he was only playing. But before that, the four seasons prior to that, he averaged 30 minutes a game. And he averaged like 14 points a game. And he shot the lights out. He's again. I talked about how he's one of the him and Boyan and Buddy Heald and Steph Curry are the only four guys in the last five years that have made 700 threes and shot 40 percent during that time. So he's lights out shooter. We'll see what happens with him, whether he's traded or not. Again, if Boyan gets traded, that could give him some uh, playing time. Anyway, I've gone way over what I wanted to, but shout out to Jamil McMillan. That's Nate McMillan's son that was a coach, longtime coach in the NBA. He's going to be coaching the Motor City Crews, and he's going to, he's only 34 years old, but he's was part of uh, Monty's uh, coaching staff development, player development at, at uh, when he was at the Pelicans. So. Um, Giannis, Giannis has spoke out and said, you know, next summer he should get an extension. But if he doesn't think the team's going to go in the, you know, if they're not all in on winning and the players are all in on winning, that he is not going to sign that extension. And so he he won't be a, a unrestricted free agent. For, they have him for two more years. But if they know that he's not going to resign with them, would they trade him or you know do they wait for the two years and sign with somebody? Well. In two years, our Pistons, I think, are going to be really good. And and one of my favorite lines from a movie was Lloyd in Dumb and Dumber when he said, so we have a chance. And so I, will, I would love to, yeah, he'd be a good fit on our team, although he's another non-shooter, but it still would be cool. He's only 28 years old. So in two years, we could be ready to, I think, really push for some loud noise in the playoffs. So anyway... Be the reason that someone feels welcome and loved and cared for and heard. And if you have time to, um, when you're watching this on Spotify, leave a five-star review. And if you're listening on YouTube, subscribe. Please 
subscribe for me. It's just click the button and subscribe. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this podcast. I love my listeners. Leave a comment. I'll try to respond. I always do my best. And go Pistons!